كانت هناك رحلات للعديد من التجار والقوافل معها تأتي الثقافات، تأتي اللغات، تأتي العادات والتقاليد هذا يشكل فرصة لأبناء البلد للتفاعل مع هذه الثقافات وبالتالي تكوين رؤى وتقاليد جديدة تميزت الإمارات موقعها الاستراتيجي والتجاري والاقتصادي المهم في منطقة الخليج والشرق الأوسط بشكل عام استطاعت الفرق الاستكشافية في الإمارات العثور على العديد من اللقى والبقايا الفخارية في مناطق عديدة من الدولة هذه اللقى تدل على تواصل حضاري ما بين دول آسيا في تلك الفترة وخاصة الصين الهند بلاد الرافدين ومنطقة الإمارات طبعاً عندما نتحدث عن الأهمية التاريخية لدولة الإمارات من ناحية الثقافة ومن ناحية وجود الكم الهائل من المتاحف الغنى بنوعية هذه المتاحف وبما تملك هذه المتاحف هو انعكاس واضح لأهمية الإمارات عمر التاريخ يعني أحياناً نجد هناك فخارية قادمة من بلاد الرافدين هذا يعني كان هناك تبادل تجاري منذ الألفية الثالثة والألفية الثانية قبل الميلاد واستمرت ذلك في العصور الكلاسيكية A nation is known by its own history. Historical records teach the present and the future generations about their past, about the contributions and achievements of their leaders. التراث لا يعني فقط انه هو في بعد الاقتصادي فقط نعم المواقع الاثريه لها دور محوري وها مثل النفط. محرك اقتصادي هام تلعب دورا استثنائيا في السياحه ما تنتجه الامارات اليوم تنتج الافكار الجديده المتمثله في انشاء مجتمع جديد يتناغم مع المجتمع العالمي ويرتبط معه بروابط ثقافيه وتجاريه واقتصاديه وحضاريه ايضا tolerance and acceptance of other religions and cultures while at the same time remaining firmly rooted in their own rich traditions form the essence of UAE's national identity and the core values of UAE society. كل من لديه إرث حضاري عميق وطويل وقديم يبني على هذا الإرث في سبيل مستقبل أفضل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سمو الشيخ حامد بن زايد آل نهيان سمو الشيوخ أصحاب المعالي والسعادة الضيوف الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اسمحوا لي بداية بالتعريف عن نفسي أنا اليازيا جاسم الحوسني مدير إدارة الاتصال الإعلامي بمركز ترنز للبحوث والاستشارات وتشرف اليوم أن أتولى مهمة إدارة هذا الحوار بعنوان طرق الحرير تطور التجارة بين الماضي والحاضر الذي سيقدمها ضيفنا المميز البروفيسور بيتر فرانكوبان أستاذ التاريخ العالمي في جامعة أكسفورد ونلفت عنايتكم إلى أن المحاضرة ستكون باللغة الإنجليزية وبإمكانكم استخدام السماعات لمتابعة الترجمة الفورية واسمحوا لي الآن بنتحدث باللغة الإنجليزية Your Highnesses, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen It is both an honor and a privilege to moderate today's session that will shed light on the Silk Road's unraveling the tapestry of ancient and modern trade. Today's session will be delivered by Professor Peter Frankopan, Professor of Global History at the University of Oxford and Professor of Silk Road's studies at King's College, Cambridge. Professor Frankopan will shed light on the importance of the Silk Roads from antiquity to today, showing how cosmopolitanism tolerance and wealth blossomed in different cities, and how trade routes, both over land and over the seas, including the Gulf, linked Europe, Africa, and Asia 
in an age of globalization that dates back millennia. Please join me in welcoming Professor Frank Copan to begin his lecture. Your Highness, Your Highnesses, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege and an honor to be with you here today in Abu Dhabi to be talking about the importance of history, the queen of all of the subjects that teaches us so much about the past that we need to understand for the present day. As the great scholar Ibn Sina said, to understand events, you need to understand their true causes. And in a world today of such enormous change, unprecedented in its speed and its scale, of new technologies, of uh, transitions into different kinds of energy resources, we need to understand that world and where we've come from, like turning around to see our footsteps in the sand. Today, we're living in a world uh, which has been warmer globally than ever for the last 100,000 years. But ours is not the first generation to experience times of great climatic change. So four and a half thousand years ago or so, there was a long period, which we know about from data from here in the Gulf, particularly from fossilized coral, that shows us how the weather conditions and the climates changed in this region very sharply. And the effects that that caused are written down on this cuneiform tablet behind me, um, known as the Curse of Akkad, the great first empire of Mesopotamia, was one led by a dynasty that was able to survive all sorts of challenges, but with changing climates, with weather that failed, rains that didn't come, it produced things that we need to anticipate for tomorrow. For example, l lower agricultural yields, prices going up, starvation, disease. The ways in which people in the past understood how to adapt are very important. There's a great king in northwestern China more than 2,000 years ago who said, the ways of yesterday are not enough to make sense of the world today. Adaptation is what matters. And in fact, my very favorite scholar, I know we have some teachers in the audience today, my favorite scholar, almost of all time, lived just up, just up in the Gulf in Basra called Al-Jahiz. Al-Jahiz, we are here, used to rent bookshops overnight so he could read the books. And when he was an old man, he was found dead one morning because he'd reached to the top of the bookshelves and they'd fallen down on him and killed him. And this is the man who died doing what he loved doing. But even ja Al Jahiz, more than a thousand years ago, wrote and said, if the air is bad, the water is bad, and the land is bad, thinking about sustainability, thinking about environmental concerns and about change has been something that has preoccupied our ancestors for thousands of years. Now, I'm here today to talk to you about exchanges and about the world that built us uh, into one global community. And although we think of globalization as being something very new, 21st century, maybe the 20th century, in fact, we can think of these patterns as having much, much deeper and longer heritages. So new technologies, for example, uh, that bound the world together uh, about four millennia ago happened when the, the most important early cities in the Nile Valley, in Mesopotamia, in the Indus Valley, in the Yangtze, Yellow River, Mekong, uh, were, were connected by the introduction of the spreads of metals, and in particular of bronze. People were excited about learning new techniques to make things look different, to be more resilient. The new uses you could have of bronze for armor, for decoration, the ways in which these could be adopted helped bring communities together, spreading ideas. We see something similar from the map behind me, which maps two things together. The colors don't tell you too much but they map the spread of walnuts and they map the spread of languages. Because when we travel, we bring with us our different foods that we enjoy. We introduce and we speak different languages and there are words that will follow from one to the other. Those movements between us have introduced so much in the past to the worlds that we know. The Silk Roads, these connections linking all of Asia and Europe and Africa were corridors that carried people and goods and things like food. Here, the distribution of rice. Rice is the single biggest generator of calories globally today, but also of genetics. The ways in which these connections link us together have deep, deep roots. I have behind me a coin made 2,000 years ago with the image of a Roman emperor on the front. 
And this coin we can imagine passing through the Gulf after it was bought, after it was used to buy precious objects, maybe incense or aromatics that came from Arabia, and was then taken by ship from the Gulf through to India, where this coin was found, of these exchanges that last and span large distances. Here from Arabia, a beautiful image of a woman with eyes from South, from South Asia, almost certainly from Myanmar, from Burma, and gold probably from the mines of Afghanistan, possibly from here in Arabia. People have always wanted things that are different, that are valuable, that are special, to the point that we can even see these cowrie shells, uh, which you find particularly in the Maldives and in South Asia, being used for currency um, in places like China, in the Indus Valley. And there's a good reason why these cowrie shells were used, because they're very, very hard to copy and to fake. So the ways in which people learnt, how did they borrow, how did they use, what mattered to them, goes back thousands of years. And of course, some of those exchanges are driven by very simple geographical things, like the winds here in the Gulf, with the monsoon taking you in one direction for six months, and then the other shapes how people lived, what they ate, who they married, what languages they spoke. Now, about 200 years ago, German geographers began to call these connections the Silk Roads, the Seidenstrassen. And we must think about these in an abstract way. There's no, in, in Britain, my country, we, people often ask if the Silk Roads are like a set of motorways. Do we take this road or this road? And is one place on it or not? The Silk Roads are just an abstract way to capture the ways in which connections were made, linking Europe and all of Asia through to the Pacific coast, crossing over deserts and mountains, crossing through the seas. But the most important part in antiquity was, in fact, Asia. Asia has always been the most populated continent and always been the home of the most cities. And cities, as you know from Abu Dhabi and Dubai, bring people together from different parts of the world. They create high levels of exchange. People exchange goods, but they exchange ideas, they exchange languages, they exchange beliefs, fashions, and food. And so the interest of trying to connect these worlds together has been something that some of the great empires in the past have thought about. Alexander the Great, famous here as Iskander, Iskander famous all the way through into Indonesia, didn't build his empire by turning towards what's now France and Germany and Italy, but by coming first through Egypt, but then through into the Himalayas, right the way through Central Asia. The motivation for Roman emperors was the same. The key provinces of Rome it was Egypt and access to the Red Sea, the, the territories into the east. The emperor Trajan reached the Gulf and knelt down and wished he was a younger man, that he too could explore through the Gulf and make it the whole way to India, as Alexander had done. In fact, Asia was so important that Rome built a new city, which was called New Rome, like York was called New York in the United States. And this great city, New Rome, soon became called the city of Constantine, the man who founded it, the emperor of Constantine, so Constantinople, and today is known as the great city of Istanbul, bringing Rome closer physically to trade connections, to the sources of wealth, to textiles, to gold, to metals, to ideas. And this world of the Silk Roads is one which we can find everywhere we look. From the great cities of Samarkand uh, across Central Asia, we see rulers here, Sogdian traders who became rich from being involved in the trade, not just of connecting places together, but by being a central point too. So we have uh, images here from uh, cities in now Tajikistan, which have been almost lost to history, where we see envoys coming to see the ruler uh, of Sogdia, the great Central Asian empire, um, coming from Japan, from Korea, from Persia, from the Arabian lands, coming to talk to him, uh, to pay him homage, to buy gifts, to try to find a way of trading. These models, very similar to Abu Dhabi, of today, places that encourage people to trade and become wealthy as a result. And in fact, here in your glorious Louvre Museum of Abu Dhabi, which I'll show you a picture of later, the images of horses and of camels, of plates from Central Asia, death masks from China, tell us so much about these connections deep into the past where geographies were joined together. Sometimes when you have geographies that joined with the expansion of the great 
Arab Empire, uh, you, the, the creation was of, of large spaces that galvanized all sorts of new ideas, allowed people to spread culture and fashions, music and song, although that wasn't always good news. We have a beautiful poem written 1,200 years ago in Andalus, Al Andalus in southern Spain, of a man standing next to a single um, date palm tree saying, you and I, O oh tree, we are far from our orient home. If the tree could cry, he would cry, surely like I do, to miss my homeland of where my culture truly comes from. These expansions, so important in connecting places together, and of course, helping to drive trade. We have amazing texts written in Arabic um, about Chinese textiles being brought to cover the Kaaba in Mecca. We find uh, ceramics that are being shipped from the east towards the Gulf. One single ship found off the coast of Indonesia carrying 70,000 ceramic plates and bowls, all for customers in the Gulf and beyond. This world connected other people too. We found Vikings, uh, from Scandinavia, traveling down the river systems of what's now Russia and Ukraine to trade with people in Central Asia and beyond, in fam most famously in Baghdad. We find Islamic silver in these, on these rivers, in places like Gotland in Sweden, in enormous quantities. And here behind me, a runestone, a stone set up by a mother to mourn her son and his friends who died on their travels into Serkland, the land of the Saracens, the Arab lands. These connections, they brought ideas over huge distances. This image of the Buddha found in a grave in Sweden. These incredible distances, these common histories we have by people traveling along the Silk Roads to make their fortunes, to find knowledge, to find a way of learning from other parts of the world. One of those great places of the past, of course, the great city of Baghdad. This is an image from an illustrated edition of a book that I made um, for younger readers, uh, but to show how the great walled city brought cosmopolitan scholars from all backgrounds together to learn about astronomy, to learn about optics. And again, yesterday was International Day of Education for teachers who will know this as they tell all of their students. One scholar, Ibn Zafar, telling his students, approximation is not good enough. Accuracy is what matters. Something every teacher will remember and will know as they try to encourage their students to give not a nearly correct answer, but the correct answer. And when you bring people together into cosmopolitan centers, when there is funding and patronage, all of the arts blossom. In fact, in Baghdad, the so-called House of Wisdom, where scholars poured over the works of Aristotle, thought about new cures for medicine, thought about how to treat horses, how to learn from the classical world, how to read Greek poetry and philosophy, as well as in other languages too. These great cosmopolitan centers, hugely important in encouraging people to work together. And perhaps the single most important uh, work of literature that we can think of of this high classical Middle Ages of the Arab world is the 1001 Nights, famous to everybody from Disney films to the stories we tell our children about heroes, about the villains, who we should trust, who we should fear. But A Thousand and One Nights is above all a cosmopolitan story, set of stories. It brings together stories from the Gulf, from Sanskrit, from India, from China, from Jewish traditions, into one work that blends all of these cultures together, because often that's what empires do. And these silk roads, these connections weaving across Asia, uh, are what helped empires stick together. So Chinggis Khan, the great Genghis Khan, who has a very bad PR company that represents the Mongols, famous for being ultra-violent, actually controlled an empire that was hugely sophisticated, very tolerant, brought together scholars, textile makers, architects, back to the center to encourage them to build great monuments. But the dominant of the Mongols was about control over infrastructure, over communication, over information, over ability to be able to get news from one side of the empire to the other and to be able to control. And that's how all states function well. A good, smart bureaucracy, clever administrators who learn their lessons from the past. And we see this across many empires too in history. The great Ottoman Empire, an empire that was truly global with uh, lands in Europe, Africa, 
and Asia that brought together for 700 years so many of these traditions that blended different geographies, different climates, different cultures, different ecologies into a system that was able to flourish successfully, thinking about trade, how to facilitate people moving around. And these empires, I could go on all day, but I, I'm, unfortunately I'm not allowed to, or I can't go on all day. But we see this through the empire of the great Timur, Tamburlaine, as he's known often in Britain. Again, the same processes of always trying to think about trade routes, about connections, about how to be uh, able to, to control access to goods and markets. We see this in even places like in India, so closely linked in its Persianate culture, its roots, of the Mughal rulers into not just the Middle East, but also to Central Asia, where here, perhaps the most famous building on earth today, the Taj Mahal, um, is connected to Central Asian classical architecture. This is a visual image that is recognizable to people across many homelands and not just in India. In fact, the Silk Roads were not just inter interesting and important for linking Africa and Europe and Asia together, they also play a role in other events of global history. Now, if we were doing a quiz, I would ask what is the most important geopolitical moment of the last 500 years? And I would probably think a close answer would be the Declaration of Independence of the United States in 1776. The United States, a huge global superpower, militarily, culturally, still today, but the scene behind me is the, one of the most famous and important moments of the American Declaration of Independence, the events that built up to it. This is the Boston Tea Party, where uh, people dressed up as uh, Native Americans were dropping uh, tea from China, brought from India by the British into the harbour to protest that they didn't want to be treated in the same way that the British treated their subjects in India. The British had built a great empire, controlling infrastructure, networks, ports, uh, information uh, exchanges that allowed them to have a great control over sea and over land. And India was the prize jewel, partly because of the goods that came from there, minerals, metals, wood, but also uh, the ability to trade with China and tea. So the American independence has a connection to the Silk Roads the growth of Russia into an enormous empire, starting in this dark green color behind me, expanding eventually over the course of, of 200 years. Russia grew at a rate of 55 square miles every single day from 1812 for the next 100 years. In fact, Russia made it the whole way to control all of Alaska, even had colony settlements in California. Because the ways in which we think about taking over territory is not about making a map bigger, it's about being strategic, trying to think about how to harmonize, how to bring goods together, how to get people to move more easily, how to globalize, how to regionalize, how to encourage trade. Even in the 20th century, those Silk Roads have been important. Many people are, think, are talking about the current era as being the Asian century, but I think we can think about the last 100 years already as being the age of the rebirth of the Silk Roads. Now, um, in Versailles, the settlements that were reached at the end of the First World War, decisions made that have, a, of course, direct impact on what is happening in this region and in the wider Middle East today for all of its faults and its failings and difficulties and escalations. But since that time, over the last hundred years that have followed, we've seen dramatic change, perhaps most obviously here in Abu Dhabi itself, which has blossomed and grown as a combination of transitions to fossil fuels and energies, transition to thinking about financial services, how to make a cosmopolitan city that attracts the people who want to shape the future of this city and of this country uh, and this emirate of this country uh, in the decades to come. Those changes have been dramatic, not just here, but in Central Asia, in China, in India, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in places that are all connected by these silk roads. In the Louvre I mentioned here, you have one of your most beautiful and important galleries uh, connected to the silk roads, not just to show regional connections, but to show how long these long histories of borrowing, of exchange, of travel all are. And of course, I'll show you, here I am, in the Silk Roads galleries to show how much I enjoy uh, these spaces, how we've learnt, how, we've, how we bury in the same way, how we worship in similar ways, how we've learnt how to be tolerant. These are really important lessons that we can learn from the past. 
but perhaps the most important and interesting part of the Silk Roads and the rebirth are about the ways in which these new connections are part of today's geopolitics and globalized trade. Now, I suppose the most famous of these is China's so-called Belt and Road Initiative, which is one belt and one road, which is trying, in the words of Xi Jinping, to encourage people to trade with each other regardless of their background, their language, their ethnicity, their religion, the ways in which investing in common futures is a positive thing. That Chinese model is one which in some places is very controversial, but it speaks to the idea of trying to find ways of putting differences to one side and to think about what these connections might look like in the future in terms of transport, in terms of energy, in terms of infrastructure, not just of ports and airports, railway lines, but also things like desalination, things like energy that uh, has been an important part of the last 15 years. But the new Silk Roads mean something different in the Middle East, it means something different in Abu Dhabi to what it might sound like in China, it means something different in Central Asia, where uh, the last president of Turkmenistan has written a best-selling book, best-selling book in Turkmenistan anyway, called the heart, Turkmenistan, the heart of the Great Silk Roads. The Silk Roads belongs to a common uh, legacy and history on, this, uh, on the planet of this world, which is why, in fact, at UNESCO, which I'm involved in, there is a Silk Roads program that just celebrated its 35th anniversary. It's such an important part of UNESCO's message to be talking about uh, tolerance, cosmopolitan, uh, cultural heritages, finding ways to emphasize uh, these connections of the past. And in Central Asia, these new Silk Roads means how to find ways of finding states that are neighbors to each other, to learn from each other, to be able to um, borrow each other's best practices and to find a way of having the next generation having a better set of opportunities than the present one. And some of those things are difficult to do. Some of them are easy to, to, to talk about but hard to implement. Common practices are significant and difficult to arrange because it requires us to listen to each other and it requires us to have strategies. But almost every single country along the Silk Roads from Turkey, the whole way through to the Pacific coast, is thinking about regional connectivity, how to boost its connections with the local environments, how to deal with regional problems and in which ways those affect. So for example, uh, because of the closure of the Red Sea, the shipping of oil from the Gulf has gone up 182%, it was announced this morning, uh, over the last five weeks. These things, they matter to us because in the same way that connections join us all together, any interference in those connections can lock us all down. So if I'd been here talking to you straight after COVID, I'd have mentioned that the globalization, the transport networks that allow us to trade goods and objects are also ways in which other things can transfer. Technologies that can be dangerous, pathogens, diseases that can spread from one person to the next. Things that join us together are also very vulnerable at times. So we see lots of these new corridors being developed. This is the so-called middle corridor linking Central Asia to the Caspian Sea, to the Caucasus and into Turkey and onto Europe. And it was no surprise to me to find the announcement last year here uh, in the Gulf about the India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. This one with the patronage, not just of His Highness of, uh, in Abu Dhabi, um, Sheikh Mohammed, but also involving the uh, president of the United States, the idea that there must be a way in which we can all work together, these silk roads to encourage us to think about what do we need, how do we increase competition, and how do we encourage globalization? How do we put regional differences to one side, but how do we plan for a world that is changing with new technologies, new demands, new pressures, and of course, those challenges around climate change, where in my own country, the United Kingdom, we've had 40 degree temperatures in the summer. Those kinds of problems are ones which you did such a good job at COP28 trying to work out how do we make advances in this regard. And there's still so much more to do. So the Silk Roads are a very useful way of talking about our common human heritage. They're an important way of reminding us of the importance of connecting with each other and of learning, of those messages and, and uh, morals taught to us by Ibn Sina about how to understand the realities of how we've worked together, to think about when those moments have worked, when we've been stable, and equally to think about the times where we've experienced challenges. It's such an opportunity to come here to talk to you about history, to explain those legacies. I hope I've done a jo good job in explaining that as we 
turn and look at our footsteps in the sand to see where we've come from. By doing that, I hope it gives an opportunity to think about where we go next. So, Your Highness, Your Highnesses, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for allowing me to come and talk about my favourite subject in front of you all today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Franco Pan, for sharing your very valuable insights. Now, if you allow me, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions that revolve around this crucial topic. I'd first like to jump in on, do you believe the expansion of all these international trade routes, does this create a more competitive global environment, or do you believe it contributes to achieving the global goal, which is in promoting international trade? That's a great question. Um, competition drives prices down and it pushes innovation up. Because if you can find ways to innovate, then you generate an advantage. So uh, globalization in that sense uh, allows uh, new pockets of excellence to appear. So it doesn't have to be one thing or the other. I think lots depends on exactly which um, sector one's talking about. But for sure, the first thing, I mean, as a, uh, the most basic thing with history is always to think about logistics. I mean, it's, it's the most boring thing anybody ever wants to listen to, because of course we want to hear about the great heroes of the past. We want to hear about the awful people from the past who did bad things. But the most important question to always think about are, um, where do you find your calories? Uh, where do you find your water for sanitation and hydration? Uh, and um, and where, what are your energy sources? And from those three things, everything else flows. Luxuries are driven by a demand from the wealthy rather than uh, rice and wheat that are required for all of us to eat. So I think you, you find different shapes of what's required, but competition is, is important because it rewards people who are able to, to, able to push themselves to uh, challenge new boundaries and to innovate. So uh, it's no surprise, I suppose, and we talked a little bit about this before, the great universities in the world have always, the great centers of learning have always tended to be in the wealthiest places because patrons are able to fund research into sciences, into optics, into engineering, into AI. And I think that that's the key thing. So uh, 500 years ago, my great universities, Oxford and Cambridge, they're normally ranked number one and number two in the, in the world. Sometimes one is first and one is second. Um, but they have a long legacy that are the product of, of Britain having been such a wealthy empire for so many centuries. But today, uh, the United States is moving ahead, China moving ahead, because of the ability to fund innovation. And, and a lot of those innovations are, are done in the sciences, and those, those, ca those can be hungry for, for, for funding. So patronage, inclusion, tolerance, openness, and an education department that is able to uh, encourage innovation is, is the key thing, I think. Professor Frankopan, you stated something about artificial intelligence. In the current technological area we live in today, and all this fast running artificial intelligence, and then comes transportation, and then comes communication, how do you envision the future implications of technology when it comes to all these global trade routes? Well, uh, the short answer is, is new technologies allow the building of new empires. Uh, empires don't always have to be um, large territories. Um, la uh, empires can sometimes be to do with funding and the resources, uh, or they could be c about control of, of technologies. So I think there are some companies that are, have bigger valuations than many countries. So Microsoft this morning has just passed $3 trillion in its valuation. So uh, in some ways, uh, it's an empire. The question is, who are the shareholders and what strategy is adopted by the board? So, so new technologies often lead to great disruption uh, because those who acquire technologies first often will use them to uh, gain an advantage. So bronze, for example, um, almost certainly the great changes of across all of the global cities in the world about 4,000 years ago were to do with the, with the introduction of bronze technologies that I showed one of the early maps. As, as, these, as these new technologies arrived in different cities, the people who were wealthiest managed to uh, adopt them quickest, and that helped bring about a rise of elite power. 
So, so technologies often play uh, uh, an important role in, in, in creating new structures, political and social, new, new empires of all kinds. Um, and empires can usually be um, difficult animals to tame because uh, they want to keep expanding. So I think that th there are lots of models you can use. The, the, the difficulty and the challenge with AI um, um, is the speed at which uh, at which these uh, adoptions are taking place and the fact that we have a poor global community that is willing to work together and it's not quite clear how we could do that anyway. So it's a real existential question for us. And you know, I, I thought that before, you know, if you'd asked me five years ago, I'd have said climate and climate change is the biggest existential challenge. But I think AI is at the same level, maybe higher, but it, it doesn't mean that it's dangerous. It just means that the winners and the losers will or the winners anyway, will separate to, to, to one side. But it's a, it's a question that every government on, on the planet now is trying to think about where the ways in which AI will be a benefit and a bonus and what ways will it produce challenges. Do you anticipate an even greater role of the UAE in future international trade routes? Yeah, you know, the, the Gulf is one of the key transit routes um, globally. And now with the, with the Red Sea closure, that this may be something, or, or the or the cutting off, this this may be something that has that lasts for a very long time, uh, but you're first shaped by geography, uh, about where you're able to connect to, and you know, this is something which the ancestors of uh, of the Emiratis wouldn't have recognised or, or anywhere the the idea we can fly from place to place or that we can send mail that arrives on the other side of the earth the minute you send it, so your geography matters less in some ways because you can move things around quicker. Um, but you know you are always connected to your local neighbourhood. But you know it's not a surprise I think that the investment into ports in Dubai, uh, into infrastructure, uh, allow for what any leader in the past would have recognised, which is if you can make networks of communication quicker and better, then people can move quicker and they can share quicker, and then the, your costs go down. So if you can get when the railway opens from Abu Dhabi to Dubai and you can, you can beat the traffic, then people's productivity goes up. So investing in, in infrastructure is really, really important. And you know, because, because urbanization and because the population of UAE has grown a lot in the last 30, 40 years, it's not, not easy to keep up. But I think that, that if you can keep on creating infrastructure that allows people's quality of lives to be good and efficient and to have the minimum amount of wasting time, uh, then I think that's really important. Thank you, Professor uh, Franco Pan, for your valuable insights. In conclusion, let us remember that the Silk Roads is not just about an exotic t distant past, about faded glories and moments that have been and gone. Studying these networks will allow us to understand the changes of the present day and of the future. At a time when the perspectives, ambitions and the accomplishments of the countries and their peoples are expanding. It would now be an honor to invite His Highness Sheikh Hamid bin Zayed Al Nahyan and the speakers from the introductory video to gather in front of the stage for the group photo. Thank you very much.